All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of On the Margin. Today, I am joined, as always, by my lucky co-host, Mr. Mark Yusko. And I'm saying lucky because, as Mark knows, this episode almost didn't happen this morning. I'm uh, up in upstate New York uh, for my friend Riley's 30th birthday. Happy birthday, buddy. And I forgot my computer, so I was panicking at the last second. But I got a loner, so here we are. <laughs> you made it work. You made it happen. So you are uh, the creative uh, co-host this morning, and yeah, um, appreciate that. I'm not, I'm not going to do a an official sock reveal because I'm I'm wearing shorts and I'm wearing a basketball shirt for the Eric Montross basketball camp. And by the Let's way, go. if anybody has extra bandwidth on their prayer chain and wants to send some good vibes to Chapel Hill, uh, Eric Montross started this camp for cancer kids 30 years ago, and tragically is now battling cancer himself. No. Um, so. Um, We'll be thinking about him today. So I am going to do a, a sock reveal this way in that I have the Unchained Monkeys Rise socks that I would be wearing if I weren't going to wear basketball socks. Why? Because yesterday, Danny Yang, who is one of the most amazing technical people I know, uh, inscribed the first 300 3D generative art on the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, unbelievable using ordinals. Absolutely amazing. And uh, congrats to the whole MetaGood team and uh, to all of the 300 uh, lucky. And lucky was good because you had to get lucky to to be one of the 300. I was super lucky. Uh, so I did did get to uh, inscribe one of those. Very exciting. Nice. And, uh, you know, the, the tech just keeps rolling along despite all the haters. Very cool. Very cool. Well, we've got we got a big story this week. I do want to talk about Bitcoin because uh, yesterday we're recording this on Friday morning, but BlackRock filed for their ETF, which is technically a trust, but it's really an ETF. That's how most of the commodity ETFs are actually structured. But before we get into that, I do want to it's been a big week for macro. So we've had a CPI mm -hmm. report come in. And more recently than that, we've had an FOMC as well. So I'd actually maybe love to get your thoughts on the FOMC. Then we can move out to actually, there's some interesting action on the global central banking front. China yeah. is actually injecting liquidity at the same time where our central bank over here is being a little bit more uh, hawkish and, and cautionary. But, you know, the, the the big headline from the FOMC this Wednesday was that we got a pause, not a skip, a pause. The pause implying that we can actually maybe wait for more than just uh, one or two months. The Fed did, uh, Chair Powell did say during his during his presser that he expects there to be two more hikes uh, during the during the latter half of this year. So we should be expecting, I think, another 50 basis points, at least by December. Uh, what did you think of the whole FOMC? Look, I, 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 creative is is the word that comes to mind. I mean, you're creative for, for making this thing happen this morning with the PC. But look, you know, first we had the dovish hike. I'm like, what the hell is a dovish hike? I mean, the, the, the creativity to wordsmith all these words, and look, I, I don't envy their job. You know, in the digital age, in the social media age, every single word, every action, every body movement, every everything, every piece of luggage you you carry uh, is is interpreted. And mm. and so so now they've come up with this idea of a hawkish pause. What does that mean? Well, you know, in December last year, everybody said, "Oh, they're gonna they're gonna pivot." Pivot, 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 pivot. And the stock market surged. And everybody's like, oh, this is great. And now we've had this, you know, not incredible. It's crazy. I mean, maniacal. I mean, is true mania uh, run in some of the tech stocks, particularly around AI, uh, just on, on nothing. I mean, on literally nothing. And um, I mean, in terms of, of the, the results of the companies, the, the, the tech is great. Yeah. But you know, Microsoft invests something that's worth 10 billion and their market cap goes up 200 billion. Or Google promises a billion dollar order to Nvidia and their market cap goes up 200 billion. Or this company C3 AI, this is the, and look, I I've, I've been wrong in the sense that, you know, the stock literally should be zero. The stock should be zero. Whatever they earn in revenue, they lose. Like they make 60 million in revenue every quarter, they lose 60 million every quarter. They inviscerate cash. There is no business there. And this stock is up like 400% this year because its ticker is AI. 
everyone thinks it's open AI. And that's that's just stupid. So the market markets lost their mind because of this belief that somehow the Fed's going to, as you said, inject liquidity, but but they're not. Mm. I mean, save the $300 billion that they did in an emergency around SVB, okay, which reversed a whole bunch of the QT from last year. Uh, they're, they're definitely not loosening. They have not, you know, even, I mean, they stopped hiking, maybe. They said maybe there could be a couple more. But they have not reversed and they have not started injecting liquidity and they have not stopped shrinking their balance sheet. So I, I, it just doesn't make any sense. And if you do a, if you use the discount rate, the average discount rate of five and a quarter today, the valuations are just stupid, right? We've had the S&P multiple expand in a world where interest rates went from one to five. It's completely illogical. If you if you can do math, right? Which math is hard. That is one of my hashtags. Um, it, it just just wouldn't happen because earnings have gone down, not up. So everything's wrong with that picture. Now, China, on the other hand, quietly, money printer go burr. They are quietly printing money, lowering interest rates. Their currency's off five percent. That's that's a big deal. Stock market had surged from October, then fell, gave it all back. But now in the last two weeks, suddenly is up again because people are like, oh, wait a second. They really are printing money. Their GDP really is going to be back to 6%. They really are focused on growth. Now, my favorite, Michael, is they've got a new bill, broad-based, they call it a white paper, actually, which I think is kind of funny, uh, on crypto that may reverse the ban. Shocking. No, not shocking. Like I said, China, and I've been talking about this for China's playing Go. They're playing a different game. The rest of the world is arguing how to set up the checkerboard. They're playing a different game from the lockdowns, which they fomented around the world. Well, why did they do that? Why did they destroy their own economy for two years? To gain market share, to gain a pause, back to the hawkish pause, they gained a pause in uh, activity, pollution, all kinds of things. They allowed, they had a big reset and now they're stepping on the gas and sprinting away. They're, they're first to CBDC. They're, fir- they're going to be first to a broad-based digital asset system. I mean, they're just, they're kicking our ass. It's funny. Yeah. It's funny yeah. to watch actually. So, so what do you, I mean, I, I thought it was interesting that the Fed decided to to pause now with additional rate hikes later this year. You know, the idea being, and this was actually asked by Nick Timmerhaus during the during the presser. You know, why wait if you think that more rate hikes are needed? Why not just raise now? And Chair Powell kind of went into his framework on how he thinks about rate hikes, and it's not it. There are there are additional factors, inc- including the speed, you know, the sort of uh, rate of the increase, and then the level that you hold those yeah. rates, and, and how long do you do that? So I thought it was I thought it was sort of interesting and you know reading between the lines bets oh hedging their bets a little bit um, and they they probably are worried that you know monetary interest rates act in long and variable lags and I you know if I had to guess I think the Fed is a little bit spooked that they haven't seen the effect that they wanted to necessarily in the economy yet and I think they're starting to get a little bit nervous that there might actually be something down the pipe later this year, and they want to just give themselves a little bit of breathing room. So that was at least the way I interpreted it. You know, I'll raise my hand and say I'm a little biased. I've been on this program for the last couple weeks and months saying, I do think there's another shoe to drop and we're in this sort of limbo period. So yeah. I might be yeah, yeah, yeah. projecting my own opinion onto that of the Federal Reserve, but that was sort of my read on the situation. I no, 100% agree. Look, the um, the fear, I'll call it an irrational fear mm. of the boogeyman inflation, I, I think, is why they're keeping the, the you know the gun holstered. Mm. Right, it's not out facing us anymore, but it's 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 holstered. It's not put away, locked in the box or the cabinet. Uh, but it's it's definitely ready because there are people who, who despite again the data, um, believe that there's still going to be this this wage pressure and this this housing price recovery and and all these things are just going to magically jump off the bottom. I don't see it. 
And, and again, for me, right, the only thing that's holding up the economy from being in recession, like declared a recession, is that we fudge the numbers on, on labor. If we didn't fudge the numbers on labor using the birth death ratio and all these other metrics, we would have been in recession a long time ago. Not, not a not a depression like recession, not a 1929-30, not a 1983, but but a, a 2001 mild shallow recession, a reset, and that that actually is not a bad thing. I mean, there's still a whole bunch of companies that need to go away. There are a whole bunch of loans that need to be called. I mean, the real estate market, the real estate debt market, you can't even actually appreciate how bad it is. I mean, I, I'm just in the city, in New York for one of the first times in a long time. And I'm sorry, the buildings are empty. They're empty. Now, people are trying to get people to come back to work. But I was meeting with this, this guy and he says he's, he's tried to mandate that his, his guys come back. And I'm like, no, we're just not. Mm. And, uh, you know, I got to see through building that I go to work in every day. And um, so it's, it's going to be ugly. Yeah, I, I think, you know, we talked a good amount about commercial real estate. I, I sort of feel like I'm of two minds about that because it seems like the most obvious sort of pain point actually it did get addressed yeah. in the presser as well. And Chair Powell did get asked about the concentration of commercial real estate debt, specifically with smaller regional banks. And he sort of danced around the question and said something to the effect of, well, the banks that are more dispersed, you know, in their loan book, they'll be fine. And the ones that are more concentrated, they'll have some losses, which I took to mean, what do you think is going to happen? <laughs> yeah. And, and we will socialize them and yeah. we will take care of them. And, yeah. and we will suspend the limits just like they did in, in the first crisis. And you now look, a Ponzi works really well as long as the confidence stays strong, mm. which is, which is kind of why if you think about the chairman's job, it has become one of job owner, being a good talker, right? You, mm. you have to be a good talker. And, and so you have to kind of obfuscate and, and, you know, bob and weave and float like a butterfly. Uh, and, and you can't really say much. Like I, I, I used to love listening. I stopped listening to them because they just bothered me. But I used to like listening to them and try to put together just how many words are actually said and how many actually have meaning. Mm. And we've all had that conversation with people, right? Where they say all this stuff. You, know, you actually didn't say anything. Yeah. You didn't commit to anything. You didn't, you didn't give me any real insight. You just used a bunch of jargon and a bunch of lingo. And you said, well, on the one hand or the other hand or the other hand, I'm like, well, we only have two hands, but <laughs> you know, can't have three options. You know, one thing I was just trying to zoom out and, and get my own opinion about what I really think is going on here. And, you know, people, especially because we've had inflation, there, there aren't many inflationary periods in recent history in the US. Really, it's sort of the 1940s and the 1970s. 70s. You know, I, I think it's it's good to look back in history and take lessons there. But it's also, you know, we only have two data points that we're working with. So it's you're very limited in terms of the data set that you're looking at. That said, in both the 1940s and the 70s, the way inflation played out, was not sort of this linear straight line and we had the same inflation year over year. It was extremely volatile and it went down. I think that's why the central bank, central banks globally are so paranoid about inflation because they know it has this tricky history of you, know, you think you got the better of it and then it just comes roaring right back. So I'm very actually sympathetic with the position that the Fed is in. That said, there is a in, sort of an interesting call out that Stan Druckenmiller gave this speech at the Sone conference last year. Still, I think one of my, my favorite macro talks I've heard in the last couple of years, mm -hmm. our mm -hmm. own notwithstanding. But that's right. That's he, right. He, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he, he made this observation that, you know, inflation after it gets over 5% uh, CPI, it's never been beaten until Fed funds goes above CPI. And, you know, quietly, we got that we did that flip, right? So CPI yeah. came in this month. I was actually 4%. We've still yeah. got core at 5.3. We've actually got disinflation on energy, which is dragging the headline number down. But we now have headline, which is below Fed funds. 
Yep. So yep. It, it is just worth noting that as well. No, it's a great, it's a, look, it's, it's a great point. And, you know, history, they say it doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. Yep. No, it, it kind of repeats sometimes <laughs> and, and particularly about economic cycles. And, and that has been the case up until the period post 1930, where it was suspended because of QE, when QE was actually invented. And QE was not invented in 2009. Mm. QE was invented in, in 1930. And, and the reason was we were an emerging market. You know, that's hard for most of us to believe, right? But America was an emerging market. We were mm-hmm. not the kings of the world. You know, the UK was, was the, you know, the British Empire. Europe was where it was at. And we were an emerging market struggling with our identity, who was going to be in charge, the Irish or the Italians, the gangs were warring. And I mean, it was, it was, it was dicey. And no one wanted to buy our debt, right? And so, so then we have this, this big problem, this collapse, this banking crisis, and money gets eviscerated and evaporated. And we had to issue a bunch of debt. When no one was going to buy it. I said, oh, let's buy it ourselves. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's such a funny thing to think about taking a, a liability out of one hand and transferring it over to another hand, but they're both connected to your body. Mm. You know, the central bank and the treasury, oh, the central bank is independent. Is it really not, 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 not really, really? I mean, it is in the sense that it's owned by a different group, right? It's owned by a cabal of of bankers and families, but they put the people in the government. So it's, it's kind of this, this interesting (laughs) dynamic. Yeah. Their central bankers are actually very defensive about that idea of sort of what the separation of church and state in between yeah. the treasury and the federal yeah. reserve, right? They call it fiscal dominance. What they don't want is fiscal policy to end up determining monetary policy, yep. which of course it does. Of if, course you it think, does. if you just think about it for a second, <laughs> it, it obviously does. So there was actually a very interesting question about how one of the reporters asked Chair Powell, and apparently this guy asks the same question in every one of these pressers, but you know, something to the effect of the CBO, the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office has projected, we've talked about this on this show, you know, something like a $2 trillion deficit over the next 10 years, you know, to the effect where 10 years from now, we're going to be $50 trillion in debt, which is nuts. And he asked this question and said, you know, are you going to sort of open up talks with the relevant fiscal policymakers? um, Because obviously, what we're doing right now is not sustainable. Chair Powell said a very firm no. no. But to me, I you know, I want to be careful about saying the same thing that people for 40 years have been saying, which is this isn't sustainable. Clearly, they've been wrong on the on the yeah. timing. But, yeah. you know, the math is the math. And, you know, to your point about um, like Ponzi like finance, I had a I had a history teacher when I was in like sixth or seventh grade who asked me this great question, which is what is the difference between a cult and a religion? And a lot of a lot of questioning later, the only difference really is size uh, that you can like easily point to. And it's very similar sometimes with the way financing works at a government, if it was if it was anyone but the government doing what they're doing, selling new debt to pay down the original debt, you'd call it a Ponzi, or at the very least, you know, horrible financial mismanagement. But the government gets some kind of weird pass because government financing it's isn't big. like household financing, no, which is big. ridiculous. And you know, it, it's 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 an amazing point, and and I love. I love these kind of foundational teachers. I mean, I'm a huge teacher fan. Mm-hmm. Teachers are way underappreciated and undercompensated and, and all the things. But a teacher like that can make a difference. I mean, I tell this story. My, my son had a uh, seventh grade teacher about, about the same time mm-hmm. and said, you know, he was at a Catholic school and where we sent our kids. And said, you know what? You need to know beyond Catholicism. So mm-hmm. I'm going to teach you about Judaism, Confucianism, Buddhism, Islam. And, you know, and this was a time when the whole Islam thing was like, oh, you can't talk about that. Mm -hmm. You have to talk about it. This is the whole point. But my, the funny part was um, I had a chance, Kirill Sokolov, who is maybe one of the greatest seers ever. I mean, Mm -hmm. just an amazing story. Great macro writer, 13 D research, just amazing. And, um, you know, adult onset deafness, first cochlear implant. I mean, just an amazing human being. Uh, 
but he's personal friends with the Dalai Lama. And so he invited the Dalai Lama to come over and give a healing address on the 10th anniversary of 9-11. And he invited clients and friends. And so I got an invitation. I was like, I was too busy. But I came home one day and, and we're having dinner. And my, my son says, Dad, when are you going to see the Dalai Lama? I'm like, oh, I had to cancel it. Dad, you have to go. Like, what are you talking about? How do you even know who the Dalai Lama is? I'm on your is? son's side here, Mark. I would, I would definitely no, do no, that too. No, no, Michael. This is no, the, and I mean, he says, Dad, you know, uh, teacher taught us about this stuff. And, and I thought it was cool. Buddhism is a philosophy, not a religion. So I can be Buddhist and a Catholic. I'm like, who are you? And what do you think <laughs> of my son? Like, but it did change my plans. And it did go. And it changed my life. I mean, it mm. literally changed my life. And we don't have to go into a whole thing. But it was... It was amazing. The guy is is truly amazing. Hey, everyone. We'll get back to the show in a minute, but just wanted to let you know that we've got our permissionless conference coming up. This is the one that we do with Bankless. It is the biggest and best conference in DeFi. It's going to be in Austin, Texas this year, September 11th through the 13th. If you've been in crypto for a while, you know that bear market conferences are the best conferences because those are the ones that all the alphas at. This year, we've got a phenomenal lineup of speakers and the topics that we're covering are insane. We're going to be talking about ZK Tech, Rollups, Count Abstraction, MEV, App Change, the whole suite of stuff. I cannot wait myself. So because you're a listener of this podcast, you're also going to get a discount. Type in pods20 and you're going to get 20% off your ticket. Click the link at the bottom of this episode and go get it now because prices go up every two weeks. So... You know, just just to wrap this whole conversation, I mean, I, I think I think in the short term, you know, monetary policymakers tend to sort of think in their own world. But I think in the long term, you obviously need fisc you you would like fiscal and monetary walking sort of in lockstep because you know, fiscal is just making the job of monetary policymakers much harder. Because oh, here here we yeah. are, the Fed is trying to increase the cost of money, raise interest rates, et cetera. And our government is saying we're gonna run a two, you know, two billion dollar Sorry, two trillion, two trillion dollar deficit trillion. <laughs> per year. No, I mean, come on, something's not adding up there. That's well, it doesn't, and it's because the average cog in the machine, right? That average congressperson or senator has the wrong incentives. They owe people a bunch of money, right? Because to get elected, you need a lot of money, and most people don't have a lot of money, so they go get it from donors, and those donors expect things for their donations. And so you have all these special interests and all these weird campaign campaign finance laws that actually get skirted. And so the incentives are misaligned. And so everybody is trying to get their pet project or their pork barrel project. And you're right, they should move in lockstep. They should inform one another. It's, it's like if, if you're a family managing your budget, you wouldn't create your spending plan without understanding your revenue. You, you just wouldn't do that, right? Because you, you'd run out of money because we would all love to spend. I, we'd all love to go on vacation all the time. We'd love to eat out every night. We'd love to you know, buy the most expensive whatever. But I mean, not everybody. I mean, there are, there are frugal people in the world, but most people lean toward extravagance and, and excess, unfortunately. Uh, and it's the culture we live in. And it's, it's propagated by... Our culture, right? I mean, much most of our GDP is now based on consumption. So what you have to do is encourage consumption. And that starts at the highest level. You know, yeah. you can't have GDP go down. In fact, you know, military industrial complex. How do we how do we juice GDP every single time? War. Right? That's how you juice GDP. Right? When when you you want to look at the the start of wars, big wars. Look at the GDP of the country that was the aggressor, and it will be going down. Yeah. I, you know, the other thing that it seems like, war, I'm actually listening to this great podcast. It's called The Rest is History. I got to plug this. And I got to plug our newsletter, right? Byron, Byron Gilliam showed this to me, and I'm obsessed with it now. I love it. It's hosted by this guy, Tom Holland, who wrote a great book called Rubicon. I think I've talked yeah. about it on the show before. And Dominic, oh gosh, I'm blanking on his last name, but they just sort of go through all these different, uh, mini episodes of history and it's very very cool and one one of the other things wait a minute what's the name again it's called the rest is history the rest is history all right yeah, it's I'm very it. very good but I'm the other it. thing that wars do as well is you know one of the one of the problems i think the u.s is going through right now is 
there's a lot of these like small problems and they're all sort of giving the giving the impression of like very large everyone's very unhappy and i think part of the reason that is is there's not a good solid framework for how we should prioritize things and humans are very uncomfortable in that environment and yeah one of the things that i think uh frankly conflict does especially conflict with an external body is creates unity internal Ah. unity Um, amen yeah amen and i think Unfortunately, policymakers and, and government understands this, but of course. that's kind of a bummer. Of course. All right, I want to transition to get your to get your opinion here on the uh, the Bitcoin ETF that that BlackRock filed hey, for. People heard it here first, and and thank you for all the shout outs. I mean, when that when that story broke yesterday, I got dozens. Of, I, I saw hey, you, did, you said yeah. this a year ago, and and we did. We said it on this show, yeah, over a year ago, saying this no one else will get approved except BlackRock. Yep. The only person who will ever get a spot ETF is BlackRock. And, and there's a reason <laughs> because they're, they're inside the tent and we're outside the tent and anyone competing. And look, I, I, I'm, I'm actually, I don't, I don't know how strong a word to use, Mike. Afraid. I'm afraid for the first time and that, that's a big statement, but I'm afraid for the first time. I, I, you know, I, I have been talking about the then they fight you phase again for over a year. And I've been talking about us versus them and us on the crypto side and the digital side and the Bitcoin side. And everybody's, oh, Bitcoin's not crypto. Yes, it is. It's a cryptographic security. It is. It's a blockchain. But okay. I mean, um, that's the most for, I have. All right. No, I have no time. I'm have so no time frustrated for, about no that statement. We have no time for it. It's yeah, just yeah. stupid. It's just stupid. Yeah. Um, but here's the thing. Operation Choke Point. People think, oh, they, they did that. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I understand it from talking to some kind of people on the ground at different projects. There's some bad stuff coming. Like, I, I, I just, I'm... Actually, what I'm really afraid about is if the SEC does what it appears they're going to do in terms of declaring all of it, except Bitcoin, a security, and anyone who's transacted in any of this stuff is kind of a criminal, um, that's that's gonna be that's gonna be bad and and but but where does it stop? Are my Pokemon cards securities now? Is 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 my Magic the Gathering game a Pokemon? I mean, is that a security now? You know, I, it's it's I love that you know Magic the Gathering, Mark. But real estate. Well. Oh my, Michael, this is bad. You know, there are certain and, 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 and well, this is a different change. We'll talk about gaming in a second, but. It's amazing when you build something well, no matter what it is, you know, we all know the feel of a, of a good shirt. Like this t-shirt isn't, it doesn't feel right. There's just something wrong. I don't know what it is, but when you, when you build something right, it's amazing. Magic the gathering. It's amazing. Yeah. The, the, the game, I mean, it's addicting. It's an exhilarating. It's, it's, incredibly complex i mean it's it's unbelievable but anyway so and just just i want to highlight one cool connection between magic the gathering and crypto which people might not know but mel yeah. gox the famous exchange actually stands for magic the gathering online exchange because originally it was an exchange for magic cards yes <laughs> and then well, it became obviously the bitcoin look, exchange that that black lotus that is you know worth five hundred thousand mm. dollars People buy those cards with an expectation of gain. Yeah. According to what's coming next week or the week after from enforcement, you know, or regulation through enforcement, that clearly is the same thing as what they're going to say about a whole bunch of DeFi protocols. it's, it's, It's wrong. Yeah. I mean, it's absolutely wrong. And again, it's not in my best interest to criticize the people who regulate me. I know that. Um, so don't come for me. Um, but I, 
I'm actually, I, I, I'm starting to, I'm starting to really appreciate what I've been talking about, which is they, and we know who they are. Right. It's JP Morgan, and BlackRock, and, and all of the controllers of the money and power felt threatened, as, as they should have, by a disruptive innovation that will, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to back down from will replace them. Mm. Right? The infrastructure of trust will be replaced by the infrastructure of truth. It just, it just will. But man, the war is going to be bloody. Mm. Okay, so I have, I, have, I have a bunch of responses to this. And I think, you know, one of the other little facts that I wanted to highlight, frankly, you know, when we're talking about the SEC here is the custodian for this ETF is going to be Coinbase. So at the same time that the SEC is bringing enforcement actions against Coinbase for being an unregistered, operating as an unregistered broker dealer, BlackRock, the largest asset manager in the world, has listed Coinbase as its custodian for the spot ETF that they're filing for. So, you know. Well, it's because Zappo is the best, right? I mean, the, the unit, the institutional unit that was Zappo, founded by Wences, that, you know, went into Coinbase, it's the best. I mean, yep. it is the Fort Knox of, of digital assets, what we use. I mean, it's, it's, it is the best and BlackRock's only going to use the best, but, but your point be kind of hard. Well, now we can go to Sinister Saturday. <laughs> it's kind of hard to say, well, we're going to shut down, but, but here's the thing. What, what if, what if you said, all right, well, BlackRock's going to take over this storage unit essentially because their, theirs will get big fast. I mean, big. Huge, and if they have the bulk of it, well, geez, we'll just shut down that that unlicensed casino, and then we'll just give the Zappos unit to BlackRock. Yeah, that could happen. I think so. This is where I look. There's like a whole bunch of different um, kind of responses to this, and I, I think there there were a couple things. So one one thing that I saw getting uh, passed around Twitter. So the response from especially the the Bitcoin community has actually been pretty roundly negative. I would say negative. On what planet is this negative? So, so the reason why it's been uh, portrayed as negative is because in the perspective, in uh, the prospectus in the filing, there's a there's a little paragraph about what BlackRock would do in the event of a hard fork, and basically what this paragraph spells out is that BlackRock is going to have to make a decision, right? In the event of a hard fork, there will be two different copies of Bitcoin, eventually. Mm -hmm. Something, by the way, is social consensus that is going to be determined to be the canonical chain. And BlackRock is going to have to make a decision about that. And frankly, the Bitcoin's community's pushback on this concerns me because it makes me think that they don't really understand social consensus. And, and you know, there's so much rhetoric Wait, about are you, math are you and saying, code. Are you saying there are people who do things in investments without any knowledge or research? Come on. <laughs> like, so... You know, just to level set on what we're doing here, and I, I, I'm totally with the idea. I, I think the way you just described it, the network of trust versus truth, I'm, I'm with you on that. But these crypto networks are just tools for social coordination. They enhance the way that we as humans coordinate sure. with another. You cannot automate out humans completely. And I think if you just sat down and thought about that for a second, you would actually come to the conclusion yeah. that that's a very good thing. So sure. the fact that people, what's concerning to me is it's, that all these Bitcoiners are just reckoning with the fact that, yeah, social consensus still matters. You, you, know, you can go on and tweet all this stuff, code, code, whatever. Social consensus is still very important. And if you want Bitcoin to keep going up and be widely adopted, at the level that Bitcoin is, you need larger and larger buyers. I, compromises will have to be made. I, I, I don't know what people No, Michael, want. But, and, 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 and the, the implied ridiculousness yeah. of... You know, I had a guy respond to me, this is negative. Or, no, this is a bad thing. I'm like, no, it's not. Yeah. But what they're implying is that money isn't pure. Mm. I mean, it's literally like mud bloods and pure bloods from, from Harry Potter. That money's not pure. We don't want that money converting into to, to Bitcoin. Of, of course you do. You want any and all fiat 
of any kind in any variety to convert to Bitcoin because the bigger the network, the bigger the you know safety, security, the the more adoption, the more that that's the only way the value of a network goes up. Is there more participants? And so to say that, well, they, they're the enemy. Well, they might be, right? BlackRock and JP Morgan, I shouldn't accuse people directly, but it's hypothetically possible that since November of last year, when the, the uh, uh, futures-based ETF was issued, it's entirely possible that those large institutions have been shorting the shit out of Bitcoin. Yeah. It's entirely possible. In fact, it's highly likely because we have proof in the gold market that they do. And every year they make billions of dollars shorting the future and going long the, the physical. And it's unbelievable to me that that's okay, right? That JP can pay a billion dollar fine, a billion dollars. But say, oh, yeah, we made 20 billion, so that's 5%. Who cares? Cost of doing business. And it's cost of doing business. And again, it's clear that that happened for a portion of this downturn. Because it's to the day that it started. Now, yes, it was, exa it was exacerbated by, you know, Sam, and it was exacerbated by, you know, bad people doing bad things, but it just, it just is. And that's why it was 21. It was November 21 when the, the futures based ETF. Yeah. Um, so not 22. Um, ETFs, anyway, so I, I just, ETFs are undefeated at marking, at least in crypto, the tops. It's, it's incredible. It's uh, and people are always super happy when they end up getting launched. Oh, my God, like, Michael, oh boy. We said on this show yeah. that crypto summer would start on June 15th. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And BlackRock yeah. files the papers on June fifteenth. Yeah, that's, that's just dumb luck. Yeah. That is just dumb luck. And it's possible we made the bottom. What's going on, everybody? Thank you for listening to On the Margin. I just wanted to take a quick moment to let you know about a very special offer that we have coming out of Blockworks Research. Now, many of you will probably be familiar with our platform, but Blockworks Research is the most blue chip spot to get research, data, governance, models, and a whole lot more about the leading DeFi protocols in the space. I've leaned on our analysts time and time again to explain complicated concepts going on in DeFi to me like I'm five years old. They can do the same for you. If you invest in DeFi or are just interested in it, it is an absolute no brainer. As a listener of On the Margin, and to say thank you all for listening to the show, you can use Margin 10 for a 10% discount, and that gives you access to everything, which would be weekly in depth reports, live data, all of that good stuff. So, again, that's code Margin 10 for a 10% discount. Link is in the show notes. Sign up now. Thank you later. All right, now here, here's another one that I want to, this one might be a little bit more controversial, but it's been something I've been thinking about for, for a long time. So, you know, one of the criticisms of Bitcoin has always been um, the incumbents ultimately won't, won't let you want to do this, right? They're not just going to let you, they're not just going to cede power here um, and watch you ride off into the sunset on your citadel. And I, I think that's probably a relatively unrealistic way of thinking. It's that's especially not going to happen if if you just piss everyone else off and tell them to have fun staying poor. I, I got to be honest with you, that is just a losing strategy because you it's make everyone not root strategy. for you. So I do I do wonder if there's some like giving people a piece of the pie, giving people a little bit yeah. of skin in the game, some that you know there is a a likely. There, it's a, it, it's more likely, I think, to have a good outcome if you if you do that, um, and that's inclusion, the question. inclusivity, whatever word you want to use, is is always better than than tribal factions. And yeah. the idea that well, we don't want your kind, we've been fighting that for you know hundreds of years, right? Seriously. I mean that that's that's just a bad that's a bad take. And in fact, oh, we were here first. Okay, great. That's the way it always works, right? Technology begins on the fringe, right? That's why, you know, people who were exchanging Magic the Gathering cards suddenly said, hey, there's this thing we could exchange. And it's, it's a little dicey. And 
having an online exchange way beats the original Bitcoin transactions where you, you had a thumb drive, someone else had a bag of cash and you met in an alley, you know, $5 wrench risk and all that kind of stuff. That was, that was nasty stuff, mm. you know, drug deals and all kinds. Of, I mean, look, tech always starts on the fringe, but as it becomes mainstream, if you stay as anarchists and separatists, why do you think you're going to become big? I, I talk about this all the time. Tim May told us what was going to unfold over the last 30 years in 1988. He wrote the Crypto Anarchist Manifesto, which if you haven't read it, you got to read it. Mm -hmm. And he laid out everything that was going to happen, including the then they fight you phase. Like laid it out in 1988. But no one ever even read it until Satoshi came along because he was an anarchist living up in the mountains by himself. And I, it, we as a community should want to represent positive change for the future. We should want to represent an inclusive, um, well, okay, I, I'm going I'm to segue. Um, Oh, no, I'm not going to remember who it was, but there was somebody on, on the internet, and I think they were you know, doing some testimony to, to somewhere, listing all the reasons that Bitcoin is a failure and that crypto is a failure and that why the SEC was right and they needed to shut all this stuff down. And, uh, and they were listing all the things that Bitcoin has failed at. And the one thing that he says, you know, it's failed as a means of increasing inclusion around the world. Are you joking? I just, just met with a, a woman from Turkey and she said 40% of people in Turkey have a wallet. Four zero. Okay. Why? Because Erdogan's a crazy person and he's crushed the lira. And those people were forced and it has been inclu inclusive and it has been a salvation. And if you're in Venezuela, same thing, or in Argentina. And so this idea that it's failed because, you know, we say it's failed because we don't like it because we, the establishment, want to have our trust system and our $7 trillion a year of, of scrape. It's just stupid. You know, the, the Howey test was created, you know, generations ago and it was about a, a legal case about some orange groves in california and you know the the thing is is that the again i actually have a lot of sympathy for the government they they are going to have to deal with some very seismic changes in terms of technology both crypto and ai these yeah. are not easy things to regulate they're difficult it's a difficult thorny problem and frankly the current the way regulation is set up at least in financial markets is based on the assumption that there are going to be large central entities that they can regulate. And that may be true in the future, or it may be less and less yeah. true yep. going forward. Yep. And so they're going to have to change the way that they think about regulation. And right now, the, the existing framework for how to regulate these things does not apply to new technology. And that is an enormous amount of the friction that's, that's happening right now. Yeah. And look, at the end of the day, we know Good technology crowds out bad. And that's just the way it works. But the bad technology that has had revenues associated with it, and in some cases monopolies, they don't like being displaced and they're going to fight. And, and they always have and they always will. And there will, come a, there will come a day. I mean, I can't imagine it right now, but I'm trying. I mean, there will come a day when when there's technology that usurps some of the areas of, of blockchain technology. And, you know, when we think about, um, you know, investing in the digital age, mm -hmm. we, we created this mnemonic, the ABCDs of the digital age, AI, blockchain, chips, and data. Yeah. And it's the intersection of two or more of those that drives everything. Because you can't do any of this without chips and data. And you can't have AI, right, without a computing platform. You can't have 
AI without good data, and you can't have a blockchain without chips to secure the network. And so there's there's all this this integration. And so will there be advances in chip technology that change the way we use data? I'll give you a perfect example. So we have this company called Chain Reaction. There's another, there's a couple of three other companies. And right now, if I have data or you have data, we can encrypt it at the source and it's perfectly safe. If I want to send it to you, now if I use my iPhone, it's not encrypted, as the commercial will tell you. If you use WhatsApp, it is. Okay, so peer to peer, we can encrypt it. When we decide as as entities, as probably your company and my company have, we put everything in the cloud. Once it gets to the cloud, it's encrypted, it's safe. But if you want to go access it, it has to be decrypted so that you can access it. Well, that's where all the breaches happen. That's where passwords get stolen and identities get stolen and visa numbers get stolen. It's while you're these guys, these these engineers in Israel, my mind just hurts when I think they found a way that has a chip called privacy protection unit that will allow you to operate on the data while it stays encrypted. Mm. Are you kidding me? How how one, how big is that market? Two, how complex does that have to be and how much stuff is that going to need? But that'll change everything. And it'll change a whole bunch of stuff about seizability and the centralization. And you know what the SEC is demanding now is centralize or die. You must centralize or die because we need to be able to get to it and seize it. Yep. Uh, well, well, decentralization is the way. Yeah. This is I, the way. I mean, look, people, people get all worked up about this. I'm just going to repeat the statement that I made before. Blockchains are just tools to enhance social coordination. And there will be great industries built on top of that, great assets built on top of that. And I think it's just silly to stand in the way of that. And the reason why the SEC and other regulatory bodies in the US have to figure it out is eventually people will leave if they don't. It'll take a long time. Yes. And the US is great. But there are actually there are a couple um, interesting actions. So A16Z, uh, it announced that they were expanding to the UK, which yep. I thought, you know, people made a really big deal out of that. I, I'm not sure how much to read into that. But it's a, little, it, it's a little deal that could be a big deal. Right. I think that's that's how I read it, too. It's a little deal that could be a big deal. Now, wh- one other one, which might not necessarily be about regulation. In fact, it seems like it's probably not. Uh, Sequoia, you know, probably <laughs> one, one of the the most blue chip of all the VC funds ever no. is breaking up. It's breaking up into three different groups. So there's going to continue to be a Sequoia in the US that's going to operate under the Sequoia name and brand. And then there's going to be a China fund and an India fund. The India fund is going to be called Peak 15 Partners. Uh, the China business, sorry, I'm reading off my phone here because again, don't have my, my setup. But um, but the, and the, the Chinese one is going to be Hongshan. Uh, at least that's the English name. And yeah. I think it looks like the... I mean, part of part of the reason for this, um, and this is where we're sort of reading into it, but what they the reason that they cite is that it's become too complicated uh, to operate a global yeah, investment enough. business like yep. this. Yeah, and it's just so it is fundamentally where we're headed. We're going to a multipolar world from from a single global. You know, we've had globalization for years. And now we're going to deglobalize and we're going to have specialization. We're going to have these two axes. We're going to have the China Russia axes and we're going to have the US Europe axis. And that's happening. And the more you, you regulate toward that end, the more it's going to happen. So now we got Hong Kong wooing Coinbase to say, hey, come here. And now we got China saying, we oh. might reverse the ban on crypto, which means, you know, Shanghai could become an epicenter for digital yeah. assets. For, so, for, those, for those who aren't familiar, uh, you know, Hong Kong actually has done a complete 180 in the last six months and is actually now very open to, to courting crypto. And there was, there was an article, I'm just looking for it now, but that they actually are asking or sort of even pressuring some of their large banks, three large banks yes, to take on banks. Yeah, crypto, crypto exchanges as clients. Yeah. I mean, just think how different that is from the states yeah. in the US. Today. The, one, the one, one thing there, again, back to Sinister Saturday, always remember the Bank of International Settlements and Standard Charter have a hand on every international transaction of money for the last 400 years. Yeah. And 
Anytime those names get bandied about, be afraid, be very afraid. You know, mm. Augustine Karsten's, you know, kingpin guy is not a good person. I shouldn't say that. He might be a good person. He know. might be a good person. No, he's, he's not a good guy. person. He's just not. He's just not. And, and none of those people are. They, they have an agenda and it's to continue to create this, this you know, system that propagates wealth to the top and, and keeps the masses dependent. And so we do have to be careful uh, of that. But, you know, HSBC, yeah, great. And if they decide to bank crypto, guess what? Money is global. Money yeah. is global. Trade is global. People, people, people don't want to be global. Like we, I like living in Chapel Hill. I don't want to move. I really don't. But look, if 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 people make your life so hard, I, I one last thing, and I I got to run. But in, when um, you know, banking industry kind of came to North Carolina, and we had Bank of America here, and and you know, Wachovia, and all this stuff, and then then the crisis happened, and everybody went back to New York. The the the, the leaders of the state, in their infinite wisdom said, boy, we just lost a lot of a tax revenue. I got an idea. Let's tax all the other financial services companies and make up the revenue that way. And we're like, so you're telling us to move to Nashville? I mean, and thankfully they didn't pass the bill, you know, but they, they, they thought about it. I'm like, that's just idiotic. Nonsensical. Yeah. You should do the opposite, right? You should give breaks to get people to come, right? That's how yeah. they, they, now they did get smarter and they did get Apple to build their second headquarters here in Raleigh, which is messed up housing prices, but a whole nother thing. That's anyway. Um, look, Mark, I know you got to run. This I got I got to go play some basketball. Hopefully not, not blow out a knee or a, a, a hamstring or anything. No, I, I, the, they, the adults don't play a lot. We do some drills, the kids play and we watch and cheer. And it's, it's, it's just a great event. Do, do please. I, if you got extra, you know, prayers in, in you today, send them to Eric Montross. He is a, a fantastic man and human being. Um, but, but going through some tough times as, as many of us know people who are. So I, I, uh, you know, I do, I wear, we, we never record on Wednesday, but I always wear pink on Wednesday mm -hmm. for brain tumor awareness. And, you know, a lot of people have cancer in their life and, and it's, a, it's a terrible, dreadful disease that we should all, you know, take some of our positive energy and, and channel it to help those. That's a great message to end on, Mark. Absolutely. Send your prayers. And Mark, have a, have a great time playing some basketball today and see you next week. All right. Thanks, man. All right. Bye.